The last time I drove the Defender was during a week where we had a massive tropical storm, so it's only fitting that this time that I'm driving the most bonkers form of Defender, we've had bonkers amounts of rain here in Northern California. Over the last three weeks, we've had 45 inches, and just this week alone, we've had 18 and a half inches. Today is the only day in 10 days that it's not raining. You can see the sun is actually sort of shining out there. So it's a perfect time to take a look at the Defender, one of the most capable Land Rover vehicles available, one of the most capable vehicles generally available in America right now. And in this form, certainly a go anywhere boxy alternative to a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon, a little bit more than a luxury Bronco or Wrangler. Like many of you out there, I was a little bit disappointed when Land Rover announced this generation of Defender, because this is a sharp departure from the Defender that has existed for decades and decades. This is now a unibody SUV based around the same sort of building blocks that we find in the rest of the Land Rover and Range Rover lineup. There is a more basic model available if you want to cross shop it against something like a top end version of a Bronco or a top end version of a Wrangler. You can get the two door model with 296 horsepower for $55,000 or a four door model with steel wheels and a few other options deleted for $53,500. But the bulk of the Defender lineup really should be seen as a luxury upgrade versus those American alternatives. The front end design is not quite as brutal and militaristic as the Mercedes, and it doesn't use quite as many metal components. We have plastic bumper covers right here, but there are complete underbody shields. We have fog lights down there, very distinctive headlights, full LEDs, of course, with that accent strip there, and of course the demure Land Rover badge there on the side. If you're not a fan of dirty cars in your video, now is the time to change the channel because clearly I did not wash the Defender. There are two reasons for that. The first one is the roads around here are an absolute disaster. They're covered in mud from landslides, tree falls, etc. We've had power out for seven of the last 10 days here. So that gives you an idea of what's going on around this relatively serene spot that I leaf blew just so I could film the Defender. But I decided not to wash it because it's black and it's simply gonna get really, really dirty again. Also, I think it looks kind of good with the mud caking the V8 logo there. What I think is a little bit silly about the V8 versions of the Defender is that we get relatively low aspect ratio tires. These are 22 inch wheels there, absolutely enormous, 275 width, which is pretty decent, but just 45 series tires. Now we should talk about the three different ways you can get your Defender. There is the Defender 90, that's the shortest version of this. Most of the difference in size comes right here in the middle because the Defender 90 is a two-door vehicle. It's only 170 inches long on a 101.9 inch wheelbase. It is pretty compact and that is obviously going to be the most off-road capable version of the Defender if you want that. This stretches the wheelbase out to 119 inches, so pretty significant stretch in the middle. Almost all that goes back there to the rear seats, bringing this to a total length of 187.3 inches long. Then you can get the longest version of the Defender, the Defender 130. That takes everything out to 200.7 inches with the same wheelbase that we find in this model. So logically the difference there all happens back here behind the rear wheels. It enables a third row in the back, a bigger cargo area, at the expense of off-road capability. Speaking of off-road capability, if you take a look at some of the length measurements on some of the public charts available, they're gonna be about 10 inches longer than what I just described, and that's because of the spare tire right back here. The Defender's available with two basic suspension designs. There's either a standard steel spring suspension with about eight and a half inches of ground clearance, or an adaptive air suspension that will take you from eight and a half all the way up to 11 and a half inches of ground clearance, and give you a slightly lower height for better access to the cabin when you're parked or when you're loading cargo in the back. This one, of course, has the adaptive air suspension in it, and there are also controls back here in the rear, so I can either raise or lower the suspension even further to make cargo loading or unloading a bit easier in the back. Rear door-mounted spare tires are a bit controversial, so let's go over the advantages and the disadvantages. The biggest advantage is, of course, that the spare tire is not in the cargo area. That gives you a bigger cargo area, and it means you don't have to take your stuff out of the vehicle to get to the spare tire, as you would have to do in, say, a Jeep Grand Cherokee. That can be a pain, especially if it's raining, snowing, sleeting, or if it's just really muddy out there, as again, it is on the roads all around me where I am right now. A disadvantage is that if you don't routinely take your vehicle off-roading, which 
really describes the vast majority of people that are buying a Defender, then cleaning this is going to be a lot trickier than if it was hidden away out of sight. Not just because of the tire and the wheel itself, but because of all this mounting structure in here that has to get cleaned. And then of course people are going to notice that griminess in there. If you like a pristine vehicle, that could be a pain. Another advantage is the fact that it's not underneath the vehicle. If you've done serious off-roading, especially mud bogging or things like that, then you know spare tires underneath the vehicle can get really, really gross. And of course, they're difficult to get out if you're in a really tricky off-road situation. This is a lot easier to get out, and if you can just squeak a jack under there and replace the wheel, this is going to be a lot easier. A disadvantage is the fact that we have a door, not a hatch in the rear. The door is on the heavy side. It is damped and it does stay in place, but if it's a really steep hill, it's not going to. If you routinely parallel park, this is going to be a bummer. If someone really comes up close to you on the rear, you might not be able to get in this hatch. Also, if you have tight clearances in a garage or other parking area like that, especially if you have to back in, this is really going to be difficult to get into the back of the vehicle. Be sure and sound off in the comment section. Let me know what you think about the design of the Defender. I think that Land Rover knocked it out of the park. It has a lot of concept car-like elements like these multi-module tail lamps and the very square profile that I really didn't think was going to make it to production. The creases back here and all along the vehicle are very crisp, very sharp. The alignment is done really well. And this fifth door back here is practically vertical. In fact, the squareness of this rear is what I really, really love about the design. At the moment, there are three different engines to choose from. Likely there's going to be a fourth, although again, we don't have any details about an upcoming SVR model. The base engine is a two liter four cylinder turbo that produces 296 horsepower. Then there's an up level three liter inline six that bumps things up to 395. In a rational world, the inline six is probably where I would stop. Although this five liter V8 is absolutely fantastic. It produces 518 horsepower, 461 pound feet of torque, and sounds absolutely incredible. In addition to the fantastic exhaust note and supercharger whine, the 5 liter engine also gives you a tweaked all wheel drive system. We get a new dynamic program for on road use, an active rear differential, and a few suspension changes as well. Then, of course, we get the 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds. Now, Land Rover calls this all wheel drive. Some manufacturers call it four wheel drive. The important thing to know is that it's a distinction that makes no difference. It's all marketing, and Land Rover simply chooses the all wheel drive name. This has a two speed transfer case, a locking rear differential, and brake based front traction control. So, as far as capability goes, this is right up there with some of the best available in the US. But it does not have a front locker like you do find in some really rugged alternatives. So this is up there towards the top, but not at the pinnacle. Over a week of mixed driving, I found the front seats to be pretty comfortable, but they are a little unusual in some ways. For a vehicle in this price category, we don't have an extending thigh cushion, although we do have an inflatable bolster and four-way adjustable lumbar support that's pretty aggressive. The other thing that's odd is this box right here under the driver's seat and the front passenger seat. It means that if you're a taller person and you like to have your seat all the way back, you have kind of this odd bump right there. It does have a textured, but I guess you could, I don't know, for some reason, put your feet up like that. It is a little bit unusual, but we do have gobs and gobs of headroom, about one inch less headroom than we find in the G-Wagon, but considerably more than the average SUV in America because this is so boxy, so square, and we still have a large panoramic moonroof just above that. Thanks to the boxy design of the Defender, we have almost as much headroom in the back as we have up front. That's pretty unusual for a modern SUV. I have about three inches of headroom left, even though this seat is in a fairly upright position, over 40 inches of headroom back here. The boxiness gives the Defender a very large and in charge presence on the road. Also, you'll notice inside the cabin especially that the Defender is wider than some people might be assuming. But because this is under 190 inches long, excluding that spare tire in the back, we don't have as much leg room as you might be hoping for, just over 78 inches. So definitely a little bit less leg room than you'll find in something like uh, Hyundai Santa Fe, something along those lines, but right in line with the Jeep Grand Cherokee. The bench in the back, however, that is definitely very, very wide. This is the kind of vehicle where you could easily accommodate adults in the outboard seating positions and a child seat right here in the middle. That's good because at six feet tall, I would really have troubles fitting, especially a rear facing child seat right behind myself as the driver. But there's plenty of elbow room here, plenty of hip room for three adults across the back. We also have four zone automatic climate control back here. 
Even though the Defender is a unibody design, we don't have much of a hump back here for the rear drive shaft. You can see the controls there for the rear climate control zones. And moving back here to the rear, you can also see the very distinctive roof windows on the side, one right there by the rear passenger's head, and then one back there, sort of in the area that the Defender 130 would get a third row. If I implied earlier that the rear seats recline, let me clarify that now. They are fixed into position, but that position is relatively upright. You can see that they flip and fold in a very traditional SUV manner where the seat bottom cushion flips forward, then you flip that section on top of it. But we do get a 40-20-40 folding rear seat back that certainly makes cargo carrying a lot more practical. Also practical, there's a rubbery coating rather than fabric or carpet on the back of these rear seats. And in case you're wondering, yes, that matches the floor back there in the cargo area, then this model has a rubber mat on top. Behind the swing to the side door, we get 36.2 cubic feet of cargo capacity back here, which is nice and large and most importantly, very square. Although you can see we do get some rounded cutouts right there on the top corner. One of the things that I think is weird back here, however, is this cargo cover. It is kind of a fabric-y, canvas -y thing. It snaps over here in the side, and then it has some additional little clips there. It's kind of a pain to get in and out to use. That kind of snaps in the front, and then we get these little stretchy snaps on the side. I wish it just had a regular cargo cover, a regular roller style or whatever, although this is pretty easy to roll up and just toss away somewhere. If the back of your SUV doubles as a dog kennel, you'll appreciate the fact that we have a fan speed knob back here, even though this is the two row model. That knob controls the air coming out of this vent right back here on the driver's side, just behind the rear passenger shoulder belt. And then it of course is controlling that fan module right there. It's kind of bulky. It does occupy a little bit of cargo space. Now going in a little bit closer under the mat, you can see again that texture going on there. If I pull up here, we find a little bit more storage space right there in the middle of everything. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is a over $100,000 SUV. Over here we find the controls for the large panoramic moonroof and its power shade. It's a decently sized unit with a teeny tiny little second panel just above the rear passenger's laps, and there's another view of those little windows integrated into that roof line. The rear passengers and the front passengers have fixed height shoulder belts. The front passenger and the driver have four-way adjustable headrests. The front seats are upholstered using a combination of different fabrics. There's an Alcantara-like faux suede insert in the center of the seat back and seat bottom cushion. Then outboard of that, we have a different fabric stripe with more of a geometric pattern there. And then we find leather on the seat sides, leather on a portion of the seat back, and then plastic down there lower. Moving over to the front doors, we find a very modern and industrial design with what look like exposed screw heads, but these are actually just trim elements. They aren't really holding anything together by all appearances. Lots of soft touch materials and lots of premium materials are going on in the front, even though this does have more of an industrial design, as you can see there. The one thing that I really love is the amount of storage we find in this interior, though. We have multiple ways of hanging onto the door and multiple ways of hanging onto the dashboard as well. The these up here actually go through, so you could hang on to the dashboard right there. We have what kind of looks like a grip right there to help you get into the vehicle and lots more storage going on here. This large storage cubby I found quite practical. There's a USB-C charge port and it runs entirely behind this center infotainment screen. So you can stash your larger smartphones over there. You can actually put them completely behind the screen if you wanted to, mail, things like that. They're little rubber grippies here and there. And those storage bins also extend all the way over to the other side of the steering wheel and instrument cluster. Lots and lots of places to stash your goodies here. Also, taking a quick look at the center console before we go back up there, it's a large central storage bin there. Under this door, we find two very large cup holders. Then there's a Qi wireless charging mat, and you could put this lid over the charging mat if you wanted to. This model has the optional cooler right here. You can see there are two different levels of cooling and then we have a padded center armrest. Now going all the way back up to the dashboard, you can see those air vents really high positioned on the dashboard center channel speaker right there. I think these vents are just a tiny bit high for my taste, but it does give you this large and accommodating storage area running right there across the middle. Below the Defender logo, we find a bin style glove compartment. It is on the small side. I was not able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. Speaking of 11 inch tablet computers, that kind of looks like what we're seeing over here in the middle of the dashboard grafted onto the dash. It's a really thin display with really nice narrow bezels. I hope that this display position enables Jaguar Land Rover to put bigger or wider displays at some point in this vehicle in the future, because that would look pretty cool. This is not a small display, but because of the width of this interior and the size and boxiness of this, 
it does come across as a little bit smaller than it really is. The software is definitely snappy, so if you were having a problem with previous generations of Jaguar Land Rover software, know that this generation is definitely very snappy. You can see the responsiveness here of the system, it's pretty decent. Everything scrolling through all those very options there, the configurable train response mode. If we go over here to vehicle settings, we can get some quick settings right there that's the you know, brightness things like that audio settings and then all is where you find everything else for the vehicle it of course also offers smartphone integration and then we have some stationary buttons on this side you can get easily over to some of the other apps right there i love the way that the engineers decided to give you a lot of different ways of accessing the same information so depending on exactly how you want to get to different places it's pretty easy to figure out Below the infotainment system, we find the engine start-stop button, a joystick-style shifter, park is right there on top, the controls for the front two climate control zones, the other zones are controlled through that infotainment system. We have a button for the front defogger grid that's not the same as regular defogger because it's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but inside the glass we have some very fine electrical lines that's going to make that defrost a lot faster in ice and in snow situations. Below that we find the USB inputs for the infotainment system, 12 volt charging port right there. Then moving over to the driver's side, we find basically the same LCD instrument cluster that we've seen from Land Rover for a while. The software has not been as updated as the infotainment system. It's still controlled via some buttons on the steering wheel, so we have a few different layouts. You can, for instance, have a entirely map-based view right there. The mapping software does give you some traffic information, but it's not as detailed as others. In this display is also where we would control the heads-up display, and there are a few other different display layouts. Moving out from there, we have an Alcantara-wrapped steering wheel, leather wrapping for the airbag cover right there, that multi-button module controlling that infotainment system, roller control for the volume up-down, and then controls for the adaptive cruise control and heated steering wheel over here on this side. Big paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel as well, and they're metal, which is definitely a nice touch. Speaking of the heads-up display, you'll find that just above that LCD instrument cluster, the display is full color, but it's not quite as large as some of the modern Mercedes or BMW displays. When you get the Defender out on the road, the first thing you're going to notice, regardless of how hard you're hitting the go pedal, is the engine exhaust note. This 5-liter supercharged V8 sounds absolutely fantastic, and it's pretty unique in this segment because it is supercharged, not turbocharged. And supercharged engines tend to have a more raw, more raucous exhaust note because there's nothing interfering with the exhaust note from the exhaust valve all the way out the back. There's no turbo in there. And then of course you get a little bit of supercharger whine. It is really well done in this vehicle. If I just rev this engine all the way up, put it in second gear, you can hear a little bit of supercharger whine, but it is very luxurious, very muted in this vehicle. So if you were worried about that, say versus a Hellcat or something like that, this does not sound like that. This is much more refined, just as you'd expect a luxury vehicle to be. The other reason you might want the supercharged engine in this over some of the turbocharged competition is that there is no turbo lag. Even in a modern luxury car engine from BMW or Mercedes where lag is absolutely minimal, it still exists. There is still a hint, a hint of it there, and there absolutely is not with this 5 liter V. You just stab it and go because the supercharger is always spinning along with the engine. Now because of the off-road mission of this vehicle, we don't have extremely grippy tires, and that's likely why the stopping distance is so long in this model. Bearing in mind it is fairly damp, I did test this on the same road surface we test everything else, and I opted for the driest day possible, which was today, still a little damp, ended up at 135 feet. I suspect this would be maybe about 10 feet shorter if it were a little bit drier, say, you know, 125 feet, but this is still going to be on the long side for the segment, if you're going to be comparing this against some of the other German alternatives. Part of that's of course because of the vehicle's weight, but a lot of it also has to do with the tire compounds. You can see they're clearing a lot of the mud that's been going on here over the last few days. At any rate, this is definitely well adapted to its off-road mission thanks to the suspension tune, and of course it is wicked fast, but don't expect this to handle quite like an X5M or a GLE 63. When it comes to the handling score, because this is up there in the next price and performance tier, I'm going to have to give this a C plus when it comes to handling. This is absolutely not going to handle like those other options. But on the other hand, it's not sloppy either. So don't get me wrong. This handles really well, and you could definitely have an awful lot of fun with your Defender V8, but you shouldn't take this to an autocross course or a track for a track day. It's not well equipped for that from the factory. Obviously, you could probably tweak it, but then that would kind of defeat the point 
of the Defender in its own right. Instead, this is the kind of vehicle designed to have an awful lot of fun out on a winding mountain road like this, and then of course take it off the beaten path when you need to. Out on a rougher road surface like the gravel road that I'm on here, which has definitely become a little bit rougher after the last few storms, the ride quality is still excellent in the Defender, and that really puts this in a different category to most performance luxury SUVs, like for instance a BMW X5M or something like that, because those get very, very firm. Land Rover, on the other hand, is a brand that is absolutely dedicated to off-road ability, even in more on-road focused, performance focused models like the Defender V8. And that's probably why I like this vehicle so much, because this is the kind of vehicle that if you live off the beaten path like I do, if you live in the country, on a farm, or ranch, out in the forest, wherever it is that you may be, you could more easily adapt this into that existing lifestyle. The tires on this vehicle, those are going to be a bit of a weak spot for real off-roading, or for more country-oriented living like I am here. I really wish this had slightly grippier tires on it, but this is certainly something that I could fix myself aftermarket. I could go with still somewhat low profile, but maybe a little bit more rugged, slightly better tires for this kind of driving situation, and it would still be perfectly acceptable. The small amount of sidewall that still bugs me a little bit, I probably would not get the 22 inch wheels if that were an option. I think the 20s would be just fine and that would give you an acceptable level of cushion. In my cabin noise testing, I measured 70 decibels, interestingly the same score as the last Defender we tested, even though there does appear to be a little bit more rumble from the 5 liter V8 out back. Now, speaking of the rumble, I don't think it's obnoxious. I actually think that they've done a really good job with this exhaust tune to make it sound great, sound sporty, but not be annoying out on the open highway. This is not rumbly like you might find in some performance vehicles. As far as the cabin noise score goes, I'm certainly gonna give this an A. It's not quite as quiet as a BMW X5, but it's right in the thick of things with just about everything else in this price category. Also surprisingly right in line with the rest of the things in this category has been fuel economy, and that surprised me because this 5 liter V8 has not been overly efficient in the past. Maybe it's the tire choice on this vehicle, maybe it's some aerodynamic improvements in this generation of the Defender, but I've actually been averaging 18 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. If you're looking for Prius-like fuel economy, obviously you're barking up the wrong tree, but on the other hand, 18 miles per gallon is basically the same as any of the German alternatives, whether that's the G-Wagon or a GLE or an X5 or whatever. And you will get notably worse fuel economy in some of the higher performance versions of the American alternatives like the Bronco or the Wrangler. Before we talk about pricing, let's talk about the pros and cons for the Defender. Obviously, the interior and exterior design is a big asset. I love the way it looks. It looks rugged, it looks rough and tumble, but honestly, it also looks sort of like a luxury work boot. You know what I mean. That time that you're at a job site and Big Boss Man comes down and he's wearing work boots, but they're not like your work boots. They don't actually do a lot of work. That's what's going on in the cabin of the Defender, and I think that's actually okay for this kind of vehicle. Same sort of thing goes on in the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. If you're the kind of person that has a lot of money and you don't mind messing up your interior, sure, you could toss your surfboard on the dash, your climbing gear over the seats, whatever. I would probably feel a little bit guilty about that. I would probably get a Wrangler or a Bronco for that kind of duty. When it comes to the engine exhaust note, absolutely no question, this is fantastic. The only engine that sounds a little bit better would be the massive 6.4 liter V8 in the Wrangler, but this sounds better than the Bronco. I think it sounds better than the G-Wagons. The G-Wagons have a lovely sound, but the turbo gives it kind of a sound uh, that's different than a supercharged V8. This has a very natural bark and bite and pops and burbles that are all real. No need for digital engine exhaust note here. We also have tons of different models to choose from, and I love this about the Defender as well. The three different lengths, tons of different uh, trim levels with base models with top end trims, dripping with features, functions, etc. as well. The three row model, the third row is a little bit tight. I wasn't able to drive it this week, but I have been in it, and it is a little on the small side. Also, if you are planning on taking your off-road SUV off-roading, you're probably not going to want the model with the 22-inch wheels. That's more of a commentary specific to this model because you can, of course, get steelies on your Defender if you want to. Fuel economy, it's okay. The V8 is a little bit better than I had expected, but if you want better fuel economy, you're going to want to take a look at the base engines. And of course, we can't talk about Land Rover without talking about Land Rover's reliability. If you're leasing your vehicle, if you're only going to keep it for three years, absolutely not a problem. I wouldn't be concerned about it at all. But if you are planning on buying one, say off lease or a used one, or you're buying and holding for a long period of time, 
and reliability is important, you might want to shop somewhere else. But big caveat with that, keep in mind that there are so many more things to go wrong on a Land Rover. That's part of why the reliability tends to be lower. Same with Jeep. If you're looking at a competitor that doesn't have an air suspension or an adaptive suspension or a two-speed transfer case or true four-wheel drive, etc., clearly it has the ability to be more reliable because there's less stuff on it. And with that in mind, let's now run through the pricing. First up, we have the Defender, which starts at 53.5, goes all the way up to 124.85 if you get the Carpathian Edition version with the V8 engine. That is the most expensive Defender at the moment until we see an upcoming SVR model that will likely start to put it into the pricing range of the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. The G-Wagon is fantastically expensive. Currently, it spans from about $140,000 up to just under a quarter million dollars. But uh, if you want one that's even more expensive, don't worry, Mercedes will have one at some point for you because the previous G-Wagon definitely went over a quarter million. The Bronco and the Grand Cherokee, on the other hand, are much less expensive. Now, you might be wondering, why did I not put Wrangler on this list? Well, because the Defender kind of comes in thematically maybe between Bronco and Grand Cherokee, I guess you could say. There are those three different lengths. Two of them slot pretty directly with the Grand Cherokee lineup in terms of theme and build, etc. We have air suspensions, we have a unibody design, we have doors that don't come off, etc. But then at the same time, the Defender is trying to be maybe a little bit more rough and tumble than the Grand Cherokee, a little bit more like the Bronco. The Bronco does come in a two-door version as well, but it's a lot less expensive. $33,000 approximately base price versus that $54,000 approximate base for the Defender. Now, if you get your Bronco loaded all the way up, that would be the Bronco Raptor. You could get around $81,560. That's not going to be where we saw the V8 version of the Defender, but it's right in the thick of things for comparable Defenders, I would say. Now, you are going to get an air suspension in the Defender. You are going to get a suspension that's a little bit better tuned for on road duty, but you're going to miss some of the cool things with the Bronco. The roof that comes off, the different tops you can get, the doors that come off, etc. And that is why the Grand Cherokee is on this list. Spanning between 41.5 and 82.5, it's actually pretty close to the Defender when it comes to its pricing range, especially when you start really factoring in feature content on these models. The base Defender is fairly basic, but the Grand Cherokee does come across as a little bit less premium inside in the base models. By the time you've worked your way up to the $82,550 model, though, I would say it's pretty comparable to the Defender in terms of its cost structure, also in terms of its off-road ability when we compare two-row model to two-row model. I have to admit, if my own money were on the line, I would look at the Defender seriously, but I would probably get the Bronco or the Grand Cherokee. The Bronco, for its greater ability off-road and its better customization ability, the accessories and things like that that are available, and the Grand Cherokee for its more luxurious interior versus the Defender. I actually think it's a bit more comfortable, a bit more traditionally luxurious, and there are features in there you can get that you just can't get in the Land Rover, like the passenger LCD, uh, we find the night vision camera, I think the software is a little bit better done in the Grand Cherokee, and there are tons and tons of screens. I find the seats a little bit more comfortable in the top end model as well, and parts are going to be a little bit less expensive and just pretty much everything is actually going to be a little bit less expensive. But there is no corollary to the 5 liter supercharged V8 in the Grand Cherokee and it doesn't look like we may ever get that. Be sure and let me know what your pick would be if your money were on the line down there in the comment section, especially if you were looking to spend maybe about seventy dollars to $75,000 where I suspect most of the Defender models are actually transacting. Comparing the Defender to the G-Wagon sounds plausible at first, but when you really scratch the surface, you'll realize that these are two very different kinds of shoppers. The G-Wagon is much more expensive, much more of a specialty low-volume vehicle, and the Defender really is this interesting upgrade from a Jeep or a Bronco or something like that that won't necessarily break the bank as long as you don't get carried away with the options list. Let me know down there. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Find us at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, check out the merch store where you can buy shirts right like the one that I'm wearing now. See all of you later.